Uh, today we're going to be talking about cascaded op amp circuits. So in a cascaded op amp circuit, essentially all we're doing is we're taking the output of one op amp circuit and feeding it in to be the input of a second op amp circuit and so on and so forth. So we're going to work a simple example here. We're going to approach it from two different ways. One way is the quote unquote long way. There's not anything particularly wrong with it. It's just going to kind of illustrate what's happening. And then we're going to look at it from an alternative approach, which is actually a much more useful way to look at things. Okay. So I'm just going to make up a simple circuit here. So let's say that we have um, one op amp right here. Um, we'll cascade two negative feedback circuits together. Um, so let's just say that this is some um, VCC plus, and this is some um, VCC minus. And we're going to make an assumption here that um, our supply voltages are large enough to where we're not going to have to deal with any saturation distortion. So here's our first circuit. And let's just do something like this where we have maybe a three kilo ohm resistor here. Um, a one kilo ohm resistor here and Let's say that we have a one volt source applied at the non-inverting input terminal of this guy. And now on this side, we're going to have second op amp circuit. PCC plus. VCC minus let's throw a feedback resistor on this guy let's make it a two kilo ohm resistor and I'm going to put a resistor right here. Um, let's make this guy 5K just for the sake of argument. And I'll ground this guy right here. And here's the output voltage that we're looking for. Okay. So like I said, there's a couple of different ways that we can approach this thing. So one way that we could approach things um, would be to look at this system kind of as a whole. So let's take that approach first, all right? So I'm just going to label some nodes here. Um, so let's call this voltage at this node VA. Let's call the voltage at this node VB. Let's call the voltage at this node VC, and then we'll call the note uh, the voltage at this node VD, and we can see very easily that VD is just our output voltage, right? So uh, the reason why I'm labeling all of these nodes is because every node in an op amp circuit effectively has a, a nodal voltage because everything is measured with respect to ground. So if we were going to treat this as a whole system, this might be a kind of obvious approach to try to take things. So we could write a Kirchhoff's current law equation at each of these nodes, and we'll see that sometimes it'll work out pretty well, and other times it won't. Um, so for what it's worth, 
um, like I can observe that no current flows here, no current flows here, no current flows here, and no current flows here because of the ideal op amp rules. So KCL at A would give me the relationship VA divided by one kilo ohm plus VA minus VB over three kilo ohms is equal to zero. Now, I'm going to put this over here. So we're going to do KCL at B. And I'm telling you very explicitly that this part right here isn't going to work out. So you can write it down if you want to. Just understand that doing KCL at node B is going to break things. So let's talk about exactly why. So um, this is a little bit of a trick question, but I want one of you guys to tell me what my KCL equation at B should be. All right, so VB minus VA over three kilo ohms. And then whatever. There, therein lies the problem, right? So we have VB minus VA over three kilo ohms, which is this current flowing up. We could have VB minus VC over five kilo ohms, which would be this current flowing to the right, and then we would have plus question mark, who the hell knows, is equal to zero, because as Sebastian correctly noticed, and good on you, I'm genuinely surprised because most people would overlook this. There's a current that's flowing into the output terminal of the op amp that needs to be taken into account if we're going to apply Kirchhoff's current law correctly here. Unfortunately for us, there is literally nothing that we can do to figure out what that current is in particular, okay? So applying KCL at B did not work. For the exact same reasons, we won't be able to apply KCL at node D either. Effectively, we can't apply Kirchhoff's current law at the output node of a um, op amp unless we already know what voltage is there because the current either entering or leaving the output node um, can't be determined. So, Let's go ahead and write a KCL equation at node C. And then see what shakes out from that, right? So KCL at C, let's do these currents in purple. So this guy right here and this guy right here. Going to be fairly straightforward. We'll have VC minus VB over 5K. We'll have VC minus VD over 2K. Set these equal to zero. We already, I think, understand why writing KCL at node D is going to be a bad idea. So we've got two equations and four unknowns. Where are my other equations going to come from? Yeah, so we already applied the first op amp rule that says no current can flow into or out of either of the input terminals. We have not in yet applied the second op amp rule um, that says that there can be no potential difference between the input terminals. So our other equations are going to be simply uh, VA is equal to one volt. And VC is equal to zero volts. And now we have effectively reduced this down to a two equation, two unknown system. As a matter of fact, 
I'm going to erase this thing right here because it didn't, didn't do us any good. If I plug in VA is equal to one volt, this system right here is just a one equation, one unknown system, right? So we would have one volt over one kilo ohm plus one volt minus VB over three kilo ohms is equal to zero. And we can solve that and find that VB is, my mental math is working correctly, four volts. Three plus one, yep. Similarly, now that we know that VB is equal to four volts, and we know that VC is equal to zero, this is going to look like negative four volts over five kilo ohms plus VC, which is zero. So I'm just going to change that to a minus sign. Minus VD over one kilo ohm is equal to zero. And we'll do a little bit of mental math here. Sorry, two. Thank you for that. Two friends. If my mental math is correct, which I could just throw this into an equation solver to make sure I'm correct here, um, we should get negative eight fifths of a volt. So negative four over fifth minus x over two equal to zero. Yep, negative eight fifths. Okay, so that's one way to do it. Um, it's not that it isn't efficient or that there isn't anything wrong with it. It's just kind of throwing away all we know about op amps. And so let me explain what I mean by that specifically. Okay. So I'm going to make a copy of this thing. And we're going to look at it in a completely different way. I'm going to erase a bunch of the unnecessary markings here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a dashed line here through the middle, okay? So this node right here, when we're looking at it from the left side of that dashed red line, is the output voltage for this amplifier, which I'm going to call A1. When we look at it from the other side, the voltage at that node is going to be the input, uh, input voltage of amplifier 2. Okay. So what I've done is I've effectively broken this down into two stages, right? So this is stage number one. And over here is stage number two. And effectively, all stage one is doing is taking that one volt uh, source on the input side of stage one and converting it into some voltage that is going to serve as the input for stage two. Okay. So if we completely ignored the existence of stage one, or excuse me, of stage number two, meaning everything to the right hand side of that dash, uh, dash red line, 
did not exist, what type of amplifier would stage one be? So it's a negative feedback amplifier, but I'm talking about the commonly used op amp configurations that we talked about in class on Wednesday. Go to your notes and tell me. A non-inverting amplifier. Absolutely right. So, Will, what is the voltage gain of a non-inverting amplifier? Yeah. What's the mathematical equation? That's that's true for everything. One plus R2 log. All right. So, one plus R2 over R1, which in this case, R2 is the three kilo ohm resistor and R1 is the one kilo ohm resistor, right? So from this, our voltage gain should be four volts per volt for stage one. So I'm gonna call this a1 is equal to 4 volts per volt. I'm going to continue my dash line down here. All right. So what kind of amplifier is stage 2? An inverting amplifier. Okay. What's the voltage gain of an inverting amplifier? Negative R2 over R1. All right, so for this stage, R2 is the two kilo ohm resistor and R1 is the five kilo ohm resistor. Um, so to me, that looks like negative 0.4. So effectively, if we can identify what each stage is, we can treat our more difficult, convoluted, however you want to describe it, system as just some, something simple like this. So we have one volt on the input. We have a gain A1 here which is feeding into a second amplifier stage with a gain A2 here. And here is our output voltage. So from this, V out should just be one volt or our input voltage times A1 times A2 or one volt times four volts per volt times negative 0 0.4 volts per volt gives us negative 1.6 volts or negative 8 fifths of a volt without doing any of the KCL or any of that business from earlier. So if we're able to recognize what each stage is and we know the input and output relationships for each of those stages. We don't actually have to do any circuit analysis whatsoever. We can just chain all of the gains together and we will automatically know what the output is. Now I did this example with an inverting, or excuse me, a non-inverting amplifier chained into an inverting amplifier, right? That's something wildly boring and could be done with a single amplifier stage, right? Realistically, if I wanted to get, uh, an overall gain of what looks to be negative 1.6 volts per volt, I could just do that with an inverting amplifier with the correct resistor combination, right? This was just a demonstrative example. 
realistically, what we would actually use cascaded amplifiers for is to perform different mathematical operations. And the order that we cascade the amplifiers is going to tell us what order the operations are carried out. So for example, if I wanted to integrate the difference between two input signals, I might put a differencing amplifier as stage one so that I have my difference of input signals and then the output of that stage would serve as the input of an integrator stage or something like that, right? So that we can integrate the difference. So in your design projects, particularly where they're looking for cascaded amplifiers, think about effectively what the mathematical operations that you're trying to do with your circuit is, and then you're just going to chain the amplifiers together in order to achieve that goal. There's usually going to be multiple different ways of doing things because that's how circuits work all of the time. But if we're looking on what the math is that we're trying to accomplish, it will guide us throughout our design. So let's, let's talk about one of the design projects that explicitly requires a, um, a cascaded design, okay? So at the end of our last class meeting, we talked about the binary to base 10 converter, right? We talked mainly about what was going on in the input stage of that thing or what the different input signals would look like. So assuming that we have all of that sorted out because we've already talked about it, Let's talk about how we might design that system, okay? So we know that we have four different input signals. Each of them is either zero volts or one volt, right? And we know that our output is supposed to be a base 10 number. So I gave you guys a, a simple example, or actually I think Patrick told me to use 111, but let's do something slightly different. So let's say that we have um, 1, 0, 0, 1 as a number that we are trying to get, right? Or convert into binary, or excuse me, from binary into a base 10 number. Um, as before, I'm going to note that this is two to the, the two to the zero bit, the two to the one bit, the two to the two bit, and the two to the three bit. So we could interpret this as one times two to the three plus zero times two to the two plus zero times two to the one plus one times two to the zero. And that to me looks like eight plus one is nine. Anybody have any problem with that? Let's figure out how we would do that with an amp with an op amp circuit, okay? So I'm adding input signals together and the different input signals have different weights. So that tells me that I should be using a weighted summer amplifier. Well, the only one that we discussed was a weighted inverting amplifier. So that's what I'm going to use. I have four different input signals. So my input stage is gonna look something like this. So this is gonna be for the V to the uh, two to the three bit. Here's the two to the two bit. Here's the two to the one bit. Here's the two to the zero bit. I know each one of these is going to have an associated resistor. all that together. Um, let's put my op amp down here. Yep, 
here's VCC plus, here's VCC minus. This is going to be my inverting input terminal. This is my non-inverting input terminal. I know that I'm going to have negative feedback, so we're going to have some resistor up top. And then here is my output. And so this guy right here should be rounded. So this thing is going to be stage one, effectively. Okay, It's what's going to be doing most of the heavy lifting in as much as it's the one that's responsible for adding all those input signals together and all of that kind of jazz. So let's talk about our design decisions, right? We mentioned, uh, or I, I talked about earlier in the class that when we're biasing an op amp circuit, we're usually gonna use kilo ohm size resistors. So I'm going to start um, by choosing my feedback resistor to be just a one kilo ohm resistor. This is arbitrary. It could be two kilo ohms, 10 kilo ohms, whatever. I'm just making a decision to make the math easy. I'm starting with something that's effectively a one, okay? So I want to make sure that my two to the zero bit voltage is scaled by a factor of one. So what size does this resistor need to have to accomplish that? One kilo ohm. Okay. So that means that my V to the zero bit is going to be scaled by a factor of negative one because this is an inverting sum. Okay. I need my V sub one voltage, which corresponds to the two to the one bit um, to give me effectively a gain of two, right? Because two to the one is two. So what size resistor do I need connected to the voltage V1? A two kilo ohm. Yeah, nothing remotely difficult about that. What about the two to the two bit? How am I gonna scale that correctly? Four kilo ohm, yep. And then what about the two to the three bit? Eight kilo ohm, absolutely right. So I've got all of the scaling done. The only problem I have here is that this is a weighted inverting summer, which means my output signal is going to be a negative voltage for all of those positive input signals. How am I going to change the polarity of my output voltage? Use an inverting amplifier. Absolutely right. So for an inverting amplifier, I would have a resistor right here. Um, let's ground this guy. So what is the voltage gain that my inverting amplifier, my second stage, uh, is providing? It's negative one. So how am I going to make that happen? By making this resistor and this resistor equal to each other. So why the hell not call it 1K and 1K? All right, so now we've done all of the math effectively. We know that this is going to um, scale the V to the three voltage by a factor of positive eight overall now, scale the V2 voltage by a factor of positive four, the V1 voltage by a factor of positive two, and the V naught voltage by a factor of positive one. The last thing we need to do is sort out what our supply voltages need to be to make sure that we're not gonna hit saturation distortion. 
So what's the maximum voltage that we're ever going to see at the output of this thing, where this guy right here is V out? What's the largest? 15, okay. So that means VCC plus needs to be at least 15 volts. Okay, so let's call it 16 volts to give us a little bit of wiggle room. We shouldn't need it, but just in case. What's the most negative voltage we're ever going to see in this system? Disagree. At this node right here, we are going to see negative 15 at some point. So we better make VCC minus at least negative 15 volts in order to accommodate that. So just negative 16 volts. Again, just as a little bit of a, a safety factor. Should be a non-issue, but anyway. So we have just designed from tip to tail a four bit binary to base 10 converter using a cascaded op amp circuit. Um, yeah, so that's cascaded op amps effectively. If we can know what each individual stage does when we're analyzing them, then we literally can just replace each stage by effectively its gain and then multiply all of the gains together and all of that kind of good stuff. When we're doing it from a design perspective, it's literally just what is the mathematical operations that we are trying to achieve and what order do we want those mathematical operations to occur in to give us the easiest path to get our desired response. All right, we are done with op amps. So on the syllabus probably or on the thing canvas yeah, <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, david what's up so we use an inverted weighted summer just because that's what i want to do but in reality would be to see the non-inverted mean so let's look we are we are done so this is unofficial if you want to bail you can bail but let's look at what a weighted non-inverting summer might look like, okay? So here I've got my op amp. Um, let's put the non-inverting input on top and the inverting input on bottom. I know that I'm going to have some feedback resistor down here. Let's call this guy RF. And I'm going to have some resistor right here. Let's just call it R for the sake of argument. Okay. So that's giving me my negative feedback and all of that kind of good stuff. Now on the input side, I need to have multiple voltage sources, right? So probably going to achieve that by something like this. Um, let's do three. So here's R1 for an input voltage V1. Here's R2 for an input voltage V2. Here's R3 for an input voltage V3. And then here is our output voltage. Okay, so the approach that we have used to this point where we're just finding the voltage present at the non-inverting input terminal kind of falls apart here because we have three voltages tied to the non-inverting input terminal. So we're going to have to look at a different way to do this. 
Um, in my opinion, the best way to do this would be to actually do superposition, okay? So doing superposition, let's look at what this part here is going to look like when various voltage sources are turned off, okay? So when V1 is on, we're gonna have this network. So here's R1, this is gonna be grounded. Here's R2, here's R3. And this voltage here is just the voltage that's gonna show up at the non-inverting input terminal. And it's going to be scaled by a factor of one plus RF over R. Okay. What's that voltage going to look like? I'm going to use voltage division because to me that makes the most sense. So that's actually going to look like V1 times R2 in parallel with R3 over R1 plus R2 in parallel with R3. By a similar argument, we could see that the voltage V2 is going to be, excuse me, um, V plus is going to be V2 times R1 in parallel with R3 over R2 plus R1 in parallel with R3. And when V3 is on and the other two are off, V plus is going to be V3 times R1 in parallel with R2 over R3 plus R1 in parallel with R2. From this, our output voltage for this thing is going to be 1 plus RF over R times V1 times R2 in parallel with R3 over R1 plus R2 in parallel with R3 plus V2 times R1 in parallel with R3 over R2 plus R1 in parallel with R3 plus V3 times R1 in parallel with R2 over R3 plus R1 in parallel with R2. So that's what my output signal for a non-inverting weighted summer is going to look like, which is, in my opinion, hot mess. So I would argue we would use a weighted inverting summer and then invert it as opposed to ever having to do something like this, just because the design that goes into this or the level of thought that goes into having to choose your resistors is extraordinarily more difficult than it would be just by using a multi-stage op-amp. Can it be done? Yes. Is it wildly gross? Also, yes. So... Yeah. And every input that we add to that makes it even grosser, whereas every input that we add to the inverting summer changes nothing. So, yeah, real, real gross, real fast. Any other questions, thoughts, et cetera? You said uh, I said we would find our V at 15 volts. Mm -hmm. So why don't we make our V 16 plus our V 16 minus 16 and negative 16? Just to give us a little bit of wiggle room in case there's noise, distortion, that kind of stuff. Uh, not all op amps, like so not all real op amps are rail to rail. 
um, meaning that the output voltage can't quite reach the supply voltage uh, plus or minus. So if we do 16 volts, we're accommodating for that possibility. Yeah. For an ideal op amp, like what we've been dealing with. So if you were to do like universal op amp two for your design project, you could put it as plus and minus 15 and you'd be perfectly okay. But if you were gonna implement this as a real physical system, having a supply voltage that's a little bit higher than 15, plus or minus 15 would be better. Just because there's variance in things. David. I know this on the test, there's an in-class portion and a take-home portion. Mm -hmm. what, what would the take-home portion be kind of like? So the take-home portion um, is going to be, all right, so actually, that's a very good question, and your test is coming up next week. Um, let me look at Canvas to see if I uploaded this yet, and if I didn't, I will make sure to do so shortly. Okay, so I did not upload this file yet, so I will need to do that in just a moment. This has nothing to do with the take-home portion. Uh, we'll talk about that in just a second, but let's see. There is the equation sheet. Let me get out my spring, maybe. Taught this class so many damn times. I'm just trying to find one equation sheet. I am the right class, right? Yeah. There we go. So this is going to be provided to you guys for the in-class portion of your exam. And it's also online if you wanted to use it for the take-home portion of your exam, but you could just use your notes or whatever. So for the in-class portion of the test, I've given you here the practical op-amp model, um, open loop circuits, so how a non-inverting comparator works and an inverting comparator works, um, how a non-inverting Schmidt trigger works and how an inverting Schmidt trigger works. I'm not going to ask you any questions about um, window comparators like in homework set number two, nor am I going to ask you any questions about the A-stable multivibrator circuit from homework set number three. So those are not going to be on the test for sure. Um, and then the back page is all of the different negative feedback op-amp circuits with their input-output relationships and all of that kind of good stuff. All of that will be provided to you, okay? So for the in-class portion of the exam, expect problems similar to your homework, but with maybe a little bit of a twist. So for example, I know um, in previous years, I've asked a question where I gave you an output voltage graph, and I asked you to tell me what kind of circuit generated that graph, based on that graph, what the supply voltages had to be, things like that. Supply voltage, reference voltage, and all of that kind of stuff. Um, so that could be like the output of a comparator or the output of a Sch Schmidt trigger or something like that, and you have to effectively work backwards based on what those voltages that you see are to figure out what the system is as a whole. Um, there will be some circuits, um, negative feedback mostly, where you're just doing analysis of the circuit. Um, there will be some cascaded op-amp circuits where I will specifically put a box around each stage, and I'm going to ask you, what kind of amplifier is this stage? It should not be hard to figure out because you're given all of the ones that we covered here. Just find the one that looks the most like one of those and say, it's that and then use that relationship. If you're doing analysis, you're doing it wrong. I'm expecting you to be able to recognize the different types and then 
chain them together to get the expected output voltage exactly like we did earlier in class today. So that's your in-class portion. The take-home portion, um, let's open it up and look. I don't remember exactly what it is. And I will probably, what is it? I guess it's taking time. Make sure Skylar cuts this out of the video so that you don't get access to it too early or anything like that. So we have this circuit right here. And then I want you to use the practical op amp model to figure out how it behaves. And then the um, ideal op amp model to figure out what's going on and then determine the error. So very, very similar to a homework problem that you guys had on, um, that would have been, I think, homework set number four or five. Um, just with a different circuit. Second problem is you've got this guy right here. Now you're dealing with either an integrator or a differentiator, um, figuring out what your output voltage and all of that kind of stuff is going to be based on a specific time varying input signal. So just following the math to determine ultimately what the output voltage is. And I literally broke the problem down into six steps to effectively guide you through that analysis. Okay. And then the last problem is a design problem where I give you a very specific input voltage and a sp very specific output voltage to be achieved. And you have to figure out how to get from the input to the output using op amp circuits. I'm going to mention this here, even though I put it here in bold, this big hint that says there is a 90 degree phase shift between the input and the output signals. That means that if you just use resistors, you have 100% done this wrong and you will get zero credit. 90 degree phase shift forces you to have to use a capacitor or an inductor somewhere in this damn circuit. So I'm telling you that very explicitly because I am sick of you guys not noticing the huge glaring hint I'm telling you, you need a capacitor or inductor somewhere. All right, so that's your take-home test or the take-home portion of that exam. Think you have four days or something to do it? Like if it's assigned, I don't know, it's on the, it's on the thing. Uh, I did not take that into account. Um, let me look really The one that's due Friday, I will probably push back. Um, there isn't one that's due Monday that I'm seeing. I see one that's due on yeah, Wednesday. Yeah. So I might push the one that's that says it's due here on Friday to be due on Tuesday so that it's at least due on a day that you know school is in session or whatever but I'm not gonna change the date on the other one. So just just so that you're aware, you're gonna have homeworks that are due like one day and then the next day. Realistically, you should be able to knock that one out before Friday easily, but because the university is closed due to the holiday, I got no problem not making an assignment due when you guys are supposed to be on a break. Yeah, that was, uh, I forgot about it.